Now let's turn to the book of Jude, which is uh, a very short book. One of the shortest books, though not the shortest book in the New Testament. It is one of four books that are only one chapter long, so we don't say Jude chapter 1. We just say Jude verse whatever. And, uh, of course, Second and Third John are that way, as well as the book of Philemon. Jude has presented particular challenges in, in its long history. It's, uh, it apparently belongs to uh, the very latter part of the first century, and the authorship has been much disputed, although traditionally it was attributed to Jude, the brother of Jesus. We know that Jesus had at least four brothers that are named. Uh, when we say brothers, we mean, of course, half-brothers. They did, his brothers didn't have the same father he did because Jesus' father was God, and Jesus did not have a human father. But Jesus' mother married Joseph, and together they had, it would appear, at least six other children. And these would be half-siblings to Jesus because they had the same mother but not the same father. Uh, it is uh, in Matthew chapter 13, and also I believe it's in the sixth chapter of Mark, that the names of these brothers are given. The oldest brother of Jesus, though younger than Jesus, but probably the oldest of the remaining children, was James. And that James is believed to be the one who wrote the book of James. He is the James who is prominent in the latter part of the book of Acts as apparently taking the lead of the church in Jerusalem after Peter became persona non grata, uh, that is the Sanhedrin, uh, and Herod had him arrested, Peter, and uh, and sentenced to death, and he had to, you know, God sprung him with an angel out of jail, and he fled. Uh, though Peter made appearances back in Jerusalem at times like the Jerusalem Council, it would appear that Peter um, was not at liberty to be quite as much of a public figure after a certain point, or maybe he was just traveling too much to really hold down the fort in Jerusalem. So James, the brother of the Lord, uh, the oldest of Jesus' half-brothers, became the prominent figure. And so you read frequently in the book of Acts of James. Also, by the way, the early church fathers speak frequently of James. Even Josephus, who who gives only brief mention of Jesus, um, mentions James briefly. The death of James is recorded in Josephus. And that's uh, really quite surprising in view of the fact that Josephus was not a Christian. Uh, it just shows that James was prominent in Jerusalem to the point that even a, uh, a non-Christian historian uh, recorded his death. Um, now, Jude identifies himself as the brother of James. He says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. It's been thought that if, if this Jude and, and James were, in fact, brothers of Jesus, it's striking that neither of them say so. It seems like that would give a person instant credibility in the early church, say, I'm the brother of Jesus. Uh, I grew up in the same home with him. But neither James nor Jude in their epistles, because James, the brother of the Lord, is the one who wrote the book of James, and Jude, the brother of the Lord, wrote the book of Jude. At least traditionally that is so, and it seems to be the best of all possible theories. Uh, they did not mention that they were brothers of the Lord. And the probable reason is that we will recall from the Gospels that the brothers of Jesus were not believers at the time of his earthly pilgrimage. It would appear that the first of them to actually become a believer was James, and that only when Jesus appeared to him after the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, we are told that there was a special appearance of Christ after his resurrection to his brother James. And... uh, it is probable that through James coming to faith, the younger brothers of Jesus came to faith as well, including Jude. And uh, it's not surprising that these men would be somewhat humbled by the fact that they had had the opportunity to know Jesus from their childhood and yet had never had been so stubborn and slow to believe. They hardly felt worthy, it would it seem, to... to uh, pull rank on the basis of having grown up with Jesus. You know, being a brother of Jesus had not really helped them much because it, uh, they had not really become more spiritual as a result of being brothers of Jesus. They didn't even believe in him until there were others who believed in him first. And uh, it would not be necessary for them to identify themselves as brothers of Jesus. Of course, that status would be well known in the early church. The fact that both James and Jude uh, do not name themselves as apostles, first of all, in the beginnings of their epistles. They speak of themselves only as servants of Jesus, and yet both the name James and Jude were very common. 
in the first century among the Jews, James being the Greek form of Jacob, and Jude, the Greek form of Judah. Both Jacob and Judah were very popular names among the Jews because of the, their ancestors, the tribe of Judah, and Jacob being the original name of the man Israel. Um, there were many Jameses and many Judes. In fact, there were more than one of each of those among the twelve. Although this James and this Jude were not among the twelve. There There's just a great number of persons running around by, by that name in the early church and in the Jewish society in general. What's uh, interesting is that both this, the James who wrote the book of James and Jude who wrote this book don't seem to have to give too much identifying information about themselves, suggesting that they were prominent. They're well known. In a, in, a, in a world filled with Jameses and filled with Judes, these men were prominent enough not to have to state who their father was, which most Jews identified themselves as so-and-so, son of so-and-so. They could simply give their first names. And, and that certainly militates against this Jude or the James wrote the book of James being any lesser person, let's say someone who we don't know, someone, someone who is not mentioned in the New Testament, because they would be, uh, if they were that unknown, they would have to give much more identifying information. And this is another. This is an argument also for John being the author of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, uh, the author identifies himself only as John four times without any further information. And while some have doubted the apostolic authorship, uh, I don't. And it seems to me there is no other John in the early church who is so prominent that he could just call himself John without further explanation and everyone would know who he was, you know, I mean, especially in the lifetime of John the Apostle. Uh, this could not, the James and the Jude in, uh, in, in these epistles, James who wrote the book of James and Jude who wrote this book, could not be the James or the Jude that were among the twelve, although we would consider that, you know, those were prominent, those were prominent men by those names, but uh, James, the son of Zebedee, died Early on, we read of his death in Acts chapter 12. That was quite early on, much too early to be the one who wrote the book of James. And uh, Jude, uh, who is here the brother of James, seems to make it clear that he himself was not an apostle. If this Jude was one of the two Judes who were among the apostles, of course, Judas Iscariot was one of the Judes, and Judas of Alphaeus, uh, or Judas, excuse me, of James in, in the apostolic lists, is another Jude in the Apostles, in the Twelve. But this man does not appear to uh, appeal to himself as an apostle in any sense. He simply says, a servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. And if we would say, well, maybe he's just being humble. Well, I believe Peter was humble. I believe Paul was humble. But they, they spoke of themselves as servants of Jesus Christ and apostles as well. And it was necessary. A man who had apostolic authority uh, was almost obliged re to refer to his apostolic authority since as an apostle... Uh, he should be listened to. The people would be expected to take his words as if from Jesus himself because he was apostolic. If he did not mention himself to be an apostle, it might leave the readers at a disadvantage to know whether this man had authority or not. Furthermore, Jude, who wrote this, would appear to speak of the apostles uh, as someone other than a group that he belonged to. In verse 17, he says, But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you. Now, it speaks of the apostles, they. Uh, it would seem clear that if this Jude was one of the Judes, it couldn't be Judas Iscariot, obviously, but the other Jude among the twelve, uh, that he wouldn't speak of the apostles as they. So here we have a Jude who's the brother of James. Now, there was such a Jude uh, known to us among the apostles, but this is not that Jude nor that James. Uh, and since, J by the way, it's, it's important not only that this man... Jude was well known enough in the early church to not have to give his parentage or anything else. But it's also clear that the James, he was the brother, must have been significant as well. Because in a, in a day when James, the brother of the Lord, was as prominent as he was in the early church, I mean, the leader, as it were, of the Jerusalem church, to appeal to someone, you know, brother of James and not say which James, in, in view of the fact there was a very famous James, well known, uh, it would seem important if, if it was not the same James to identify which James you're talking about. So, I mean, based on these kinds of thoughts, it has been uh, argued that this could be none other than Jude, the brother of the Lord. And I, I accept the arguments as valid. I believe that's who wrote this. Um, one of the great difficulties in the historical acceptance of this book in the canon of Scripture uh, was that it, uh, there, there, it quotes from non 
inspired works and seems to quote them as authoritative. It, it quotes from at least two and perhaps as many as four apocryphal works. And by apocryphal, we're referring to books that were written by the Jews, usually during the intertestamental period, which uh, were not real. They usually had a false name on them. There's one called The Assumption of Moses that, that Jude appeals to here. Uh, he doesn't name the book. And the book, The Assumption of Moses, doesn't exist anymore. But, but the reference here in Jude to uh, Moses' uh, body being disputed over by Satan and Michael in verse 9 is, is from a book now lost called The Assumption of Moses. How do we know this? Because there's at least three of the church fathers who had the book, The Assumption of Moses, who knew it and who tell us that this allusion to Satan and Michael disputing over the body of Moses comes from that book. Uh, furthermore, there's an undisputed reference to another apocryphal work, and that is the book of Enoch. In Jude, verse 14 and following, he says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, and he goes on and gives a quotation. The book of Enoch is still around today, and it's, anyone can demonstrate to his own satisfaction that this quote in Jude 14 and 15 comes from that book. And uh, for that reason, and yet the, the book of Enoch was not written by Enoch. And the Assumption of Moses was not written by an inspired writer. And, and there are a couple of other allusions. It is thought by most scholars in the book of Jude to a couple of other works that were apocryphal at the time. These are books which uh, were typically written in the intertestamental period between the Old and the New Testament by non-inspired writers who typically gave a name, identified themselves as somebody other than who they were, usually as some ancient hero, like Enoch, for example, somebody uh, within probably one or two centuries of the time of Christ, prior to him, wrote a book and decided to say he was Enoch, the seventh from Adam. He was not, but that was common. That was called, it, it, these books are called pseudepigraphal writings. Pseud they, they use pseudonyms. They use uh, false names. Uh, and that, that alone makes, uh, makes good justification for not including them in the scripture. If you go to your local bookstore and you can probably find on the shelf somewhere or in the library something called the Lost Books of the Bible. And you'll find in there the Book of Enoch and some of these books. And somebody has marketed these in modern times as the Lost Books of the Bible. This is quite a misnomer. They are not books of the Bible, and they were never lost. Uh, uh, it kind of makes it clear they're not lost books of the Bible since they were not lost, and, and they're not books of the Bible. But, but it, it can sell books rather well if you sound like you found something <coughs> mysterious that... that, that the church is historically uh, neglected to put in, you know, but the book of Enoch was known in the early church. It was known by the church councils. They did not accept it. The Jews did not accept it as canonical because it was known to be a forgery. Now, the problem here is that Jude quotes from the book of Enoch. And he also alludes strongly to something from the Assumption of Moses two apocryphal books. And it sounds as if he believes them. sounds as if he. Uh, counts them valid and authoritative. And this is probably the, the single argument that was against Jude's inclusion in the canon originally. Uh, most of the church accepted the canonicity of the book of Jude by about 200 A.D. Very early on, uh, there was a, what was called the Muratorian canon in Rome uh, in the early 2nd century. It accepted Jude as valid. And uh, men like Polycarp, a very early father, and uh, Tertullian accepted Jude's validity. But there was some dispute about the validity of Jude, even after the year 200 A.D., especially in the Syrian church. But all the objections lay uh, upon the fact that he quoted as authoritative from apocryphal works. Now, you see, at first this worked not against Jude, but in favor of the apocryphal works. Some of the early Christians in Alexandria said, well, hey, if Jude quotes Enoch, as authoritative, then that, that validates Enoch and made them want to actually canonize Enoch. And there was, that was sort of the mood of some of the Christians in the early days because it seemed like, well, if, if uh, Jude accepted it doesn't, and, and he's, uh, you know, a canonical book, doesn't that mean that these books that he quotes are authoritative since he quotes them as if authoritative? And then later on, as people began to realize that the apocryphal books had some pretty dangerous stuff in them, pretty heretical stuff, uh, rather than Jude's quoting them working favorably toward the uh, opinion of those books, uh, his quoting them actually worked against him. And many people wanted to reject Jude uh, 
and his authenticity because he quoted from these books. So that's, this is almost entirely the issue that was uh, debated in the early church as to whether Jude should be included or not. There is seldom any debate as to whether Jude, the brother of the Lord, wrote the book. But, you know, just because someone that close to Jesus wrote a book doesn't mean it should go into the Bible. Um, presumably, the basis for inclusion in the New Testament should be that the, a book has apostolic authority. And there may have been many people who grew up on Jesus, in Jesus' neighborhood who ended up being authors and wrote things, but that doesn't mean they go in our Bible just because they're ancient books by someone who was not far from Jesus. Uh, they, if a person has apostolic authority, then their book should be included. That's generally the opinion <coughs> of those who included the books in the New Testament canon. Now, the problem arises even with Jude and that. Jude doesn't claim to be an apostle, nor does anywhere else in the Bible claim he was an apostle. So why should his book be included? Well, James never calls himself an apostle. But James was regarded as an apostle. We know this at least from Paul's statement in Galatians, where he speaks of his, one of his early visits to Jerusalem after his conversion. He says, Others of the apostles I saw none except James, the Lord's brother. In that statement, Paul seems to indicate that he regarded James to be an apostle, although James was not one of the twelve. The Lord's brother was not one of the twelve, but Paul regarded him as an apostle, and probably Paul's opinion reflected that of the early church in general. They, uh, the fact that the man did have an appearance of Christ to him after the resurrection, and yes, that's, um, I can give you the verse pretty quick here. It's in... Galatians chapter 1 and uh, verse 19. Galatians 1, 19. Um, it's not surprising, it seems to me, that James would come to be regarded as having apostolic authority in the early church, partly because he was raised with Jesus. But again, that, that probably didn't serve as an argument in James' own mind for giving him personal authority since he was an unbeliever during the years that he was raised with Jesus. But because Jesus chose to appear to him and apparently commission him separately, just like Jesus did to Paul later on. Uh, Paul was an apostle because of a later appearance of Christ to him after the resurrection and a commissioning. Apparently, James had a similar one. Jude may have as well. Or even if Jude was not regarded to be an apostle, neither was Luke that matter. But Luke's books are included in the New Testament because of his close association with an apostle. It is assumed uh, and not only assumed, but it's stated by Paul, by uh, Papias and by other early fathers that Luke's work was done under the uh, watchful oversight of Paul, who was obviously an apostle, uh, that it is assumed that Luke could never have published his works without Paul's having at least read them since Luke wrote them while he was traveling with Paul. It's hardly likely he kept them a total secret from his apostolic, you know, uh, mentor. As Luke was writing the books, he certainly must have had Paul's uh, proofreading them and authorization and so forth. And so even though Luke was not an apostle, it is considered that his books have uh, the, author, uh, the uh, apostolic stamp of approval. And it is probably assumed that Jude's book was included for the same reason. He may or may not have been regarded as an apostle himself. But whether he was or not... He certainly, he certainly was in the circle of the apostles. He was a brother of one of the major apostles, James, and, um, and probably brushed with the apostles all the time. Now, this in itself doesn't make his, his book authoritative, but uh, from earliest times, the early church respected this book as authoritative. And as I said, Tertullian and some of the uh, Polycarp and some of the very early fathers quoted from Jude as authoritative, and so they must have had some knowledge of how he was viewed and his authority viewed in the early church um, in order to do that. I, I, I've often said, and I'll say it again, that if I were on the council to decide whether or not to canonize individual books of the New Testament, if I were not living after the time where the canon was firmly established, I would be inclined to question whether Jude should be included. And this, not because of any objection I have to, to the content of his teaching, uh, I would have the same problem that many early Christians did. You know, why did he quote from those apocryphal works? He seems as if he believed them, and yet they are known to be forgeries. It, that, that would seem to suggest maybe he wasn't inspired, and therefore maybe his book shouldn't be in the New Testament. There are a lot of books that weren't inspired, written in New Testament times by Christians that don't belong in the New Testament. And, you know, we just accept it because we've had the canon was decided, you know, back 
1,500 years ago, and it's come down to us just like this, and we just say, well, it's all the Word of God. I, t- I accept it all. And to tell you the truth, I'm willing to do that. I've got no, no objection to the teachings in Judah. I'm willing to accept every word in there. It's true. Even the things he quoted from uh, apocryphal sources, if he believed them, then I'll, I'll, I guess I'll believe them too. I'm willing to. There's nothing that they say that grates against me or anything like that. But just in intellectual honesty, if I were among those in the early days before the canon was decided and Jude was floating around out there and under consideration, I probably would have cast my vote against its inclusion in the canon, though that would not have meant that I, that I disapprove of the book in general as a, as, a, as a work. Jude doesn't claim that he's writing the word of God. He doesn't claim that he's inspired. and He doesn't claim that his book belongs in the canon any more than many Christian books today I, that I think very highly of. And I, I would recommend them to people to read. And I'd say, this is a very edifying book. This is a very useful book. This is a challenging book. This is a convicting book. This book is, I think every Christian ought to read this book. That doesn't mean I think it should be in the Bible. And, uh, uh, you know, everyone has to make his own decision. But I think if I were in the uh, first three centuries before the canon was established, I would have had taken that kind of position about Judah. I would say, this is a wonderful book. I think everyone should read it. Very edifying. Read it frequently. It's a challenge. You know, it'll, it definitely will put the fear of God in you. And that's a healthful thing. And there are books written by normal authors today that I recommend similarly. But I don't know that I would have cast my vote for it to be in the canon. But it's not, it wasn't up to me. I wasn't there. And no one asked my opinion. So I, I'm, uh, I'm certainly willing to live with it in the canon. And I can see ways to get Jude out of, tr- out of trouble with this business of his quoting the apocryphal books. Um, it is possible, in fact, maybe even probable, that Jude knew that the story from the Assumption of Moses that he quoted is not historically correct. It is also possible, and that he quoted it merely as an illustration, the same as I might illustrate something from Greek mythology or from Aesop's fables or, or from some well-known fiction. I mean, to quote something from uh, some well-known fiction story from Shakespeare. I mean, preachers do this all the time. To be or not to be. You know, I mean, quote something from Shakespeare and say, it's just like, you know, Hamlet said or whatever. You know, I mean, everyone knows Hamlet wasn't a historical character. But but there are things that have become part of our literary culture, which we can quote them without any suggestion that they are historically true. And we don't we're not deceiving anyone because everyone knows they're not historically true. But they are a very good illustration of something. Uh, There are many stories from popular fiction or from uh, the lore of of the Greeks or of somebody else that that we have learned in our education. You know, it's just been part of our education. We know lots of Aesop's fables and and uh, the stories of the Iliad and the Odyssey and things like that. None of us believe them to be historically true, but they, they may make good sermon illustrations. And when we use them, those of us who preach and use such things, we're not intending to put our stamp of historicity upon them. You know, we're not saying this really happened. We're in, in a sense, we assume a common shared pool of knowledge among our readers, or our listeners. They know that it's not true. We know that it's not true. But it's a it's a good story to illustrate a point. And, um, you know, an alternative to this is that the story of Satan and Michael contending over the body of Moses actually is a truth. It really did happen. And the fact that it happened to be mentioned in an apocryphal book doesn't have to weigh against it. it. It could be that Jude by revelation knew this. But the fact is he didn't know it from the Old Testament. The Old Testament doesn't record it. As far as we know, the only literature prior to the book of Jude that contained it was the Assumption of Moses, which was not a valid inspired work. And uh, so there's two ways you can go. I mean, some people just say, well, I'm, I, uh, if Jude said it, that's good enough for me. It's in the Bible, so I believe that happened. On the other hand, I would remind you that Paul quoted several times from uninspired <laughs> Greek philosophers, not in order to suggest that they were inspired, but because what they said happened to be a good illustration of the point he wanted to make. Let me show you a few examples here. In Acts chapter 17, when Paul was on Mars Hill, he said in verse 28, Acts 17, 28, he said, For in him, God, we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said. <coughs> 
for we are his offspring. Now, that statement, for we are his offspring, is a quote from a Greek poet named uh, Aratus. I don't know how to pronounce it really, but Aratus or Aratus. And, um, and Paul goes on in verse 29, Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think of the divine nature as of gold, silver, or stone, something shaped by the art of man's devising. Now, did Paul believe that Aratus was actually an inspired writer who said, we are all God's offspring? Did Paul even believe that everyone is God's offspring? Not in the sense that born-again people are, but Paul saw there a, a, an argument to make. He's trying to point out that God is not an idol made of stone. Even the Greeks who believed in gods of stone and so forth uh, had on their more enlightened moments made comments that are inconsistent with the idea of idolatry or at least inconsistent with the idea of images. And so he quotes one to point out that uh, here, here a Greek poet actually came close to the truth. He's not an inspired writer, but what he said certainly implies something that is true, namely that God is not made of stone or wood. If we're all his offspring, and in, in one sense a Christian can, can say that we're all God's offspring. Obviously, we, we are cautious about people saying, you know, the universal brotherhood of man, universal fatherhood of God, because so many people, when they talk about such things, they're implying that everybody's a child of God in exactly the same way, and we know that that isn't true. You know, you have to be born again to be one of God's children. But in another sense, we're all created by God. We've all sprung from God. In that sense, Adam was called the son of God, simply not, not because of any regeneration on his part, but because he was created by God. In, in Luke chapter 3, it refers to Adam as the son of God in the last verse of that chapter. So Paul was able to quote a Greek whom he did not regard to be inspired in order to make a point. Likewise, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse uh, 33. Paul says, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Now, evil company corrupts good habits is a quote from a Greek poet named Menander. And uh, that's why it's in quotation marks here in your New King James. It's a, it's a quote from a Greek poet, a man who is not inspired, but whose words in this case were reliable. They made a good point a point that Paul wanted to make, and it was also a poet that his readers, who were Greeks, were familiar with. He gathered something from the, the literary culture of, their, of his listeners, something they were acquainted with, and without any attempt to say this man is to be inspired, be regarded like a prophet, or anything like that, uh, he quotes him to make a point. He does not critique the Greek prophet or the Greek poet. He simply quotes him because it, the man said something he could agree with. That one? That was 1 Corinthians 15, 33. The Assumption of Moses. Yeah. If you look at Titus chapter 1. In Titus chapter 1, Paul is writing to Titus about the, the Cretan people who were uh, the people that Titus was at that time ministering among. And in Titus 1 and verse 12, Paul said, One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Then he says, this testimony is true. Now, he quotes a Cretan poet. This Cretan poet happens to have been Epimenides. And um, he even calls him a prophet because the Greeks regarded Epimenides as a prophet of their religions. Uh, now, Paul, of course, didn't mean to say that Epimenides was a, a Jewish prophet or even an inspired prophet. He refers to Epimenides as a prophet by way of concession. That's, that's the title that people would know Epimenides as, as a prophet. We might even talk about the prophet Muhammad similarly. We don't believe he was a prophet, not a prophet of God, but he's the prophet to the, to the Muslims. You know, I mean, and if we were talking about Muhammad, we might say even the prophet said, you know, the prophet Muhammad. Not because we acknowledge his true inspiration, but because that's the label that goes with him. And so Paul, you know, if Paul could quote not only Jewish apocryphal works, but he could quote Greek pagans entirely uh, to illustrate a point, then there's not any reason that Jude couldn't do something similar to that or to give a little story out of, a, out of an apocryphal writing, which may or may not have been regarded as an as a, as a authentic story, but it makes, makes for a good illustration. Now, it's a little more difficult when he quotes Enoch, because in Jude, verse 14 and 15, he says, now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, 
And then he quotes what Enoch says here. The problem here is that Paul, I mean, Jude, almost seems to indicate that this man who said this really was Enoch, the, the seventh from Adam, meaning seven generations from Adam. If you count them up in Genesis 5, you'll find seven generations from Adam to Enoch. And therefore, it sounds as if Jude is not just saying the book of Enoch says this, but we all know it's false. But it sounds as if he's saying Enoch, you know, the guy, seven generations from Adam, he prophesied. Now, here's the problem. We know that the quote comes from the book of Enoch, and we know that the book of Enoch was not written by the man Enoch, the seventh generation from Adam. So the, the problem is in the fact that Jude refers to him as the seventh from Adam. Uh, it, it almost sounds as if he's saying that Enoch, that Enoch who lived back then before the flood, that one who was seven generations from, from Adam, he's the one who prophesied this. That used to bother me more than almost anything else in the book of Jude, that Jude said it that way. Um, at one time, I thought, well, maybe the solution is this. He doesn't say that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, wrote this prophecy. He only says that he prophesied. Maybe Enoch, the seventh from Adam, actually did prophesy this. Maybe there was actually a, an oral prophecy that was passed down through Noah, retained it, passed it on to his sons. It was, uh, you know, it, it became part of the oral oral uh, stock of, of revealed things from God's prophets that was passed down even into the Jews later on and later on written. And so when someone wrote a forgery called the Book of Enoch, they included a known verbal prophecy from the prophet Enoch in order to give authenticity to their false book. You know, they, they claim that this book is written by Enoch, so they stick in something that was known to be a true prophecy of Enoch to give it authenticity. That struck me as a possible explanation, though I tell you the truth, I've never heard any responsible scholar say that that was the explanation. I have since learned that there's a much easier explanation, and that is, I didn't realize this until recently, but Enoch, the seventh from Adam, is a, is a quotation from the book of Enoch. Enoch 60, verse 8. The man who wrote it calls himself Enoch, the seventh from Adam, that very expression. So it's not so much that Jude is saying that the man who made this prophecy was that man, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, so much as he's saying, you know, the man who's, who identifies himself as Enoch, the seventh from Adam, who we know as the one who wrote the book, who we know is really someone else. We don't know who, you know, uh, but with a wink and a nod, you know, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, you know, um, everyone knows that that man who called himself that isn't really that man in history, but that's what he called himself. We'll call him that, too, by way of concession, since we're quoting his book. It's possible, therefore, that in calling him that, he's only quoting the man himself, the man's self-designation found in the book of Enoch, and not affirming that it was really the seventh from Adam who wrote it. To tell you the truth, all these considerations disappoint me. In my earlier Christian life, when I knew much less about these things, I always... You know, I, it, to me, I like to, to, see, to see this prophecy as coming from the real Enoch or the story about Satan disputing with Michael over the body of Moses. I, I, I liked having that extra biblical information, stuff that wasn't in the Old Testament to supplement uh, my understanding of the Old Testament. And the fact that it appeared in the New Testament made it seem like, well, it must have really happened. And as I say, that's how a lot of a lot of the early Christians understood this. If Jude quoted it, it must have really been true. But the, it has created problems, and a lot of early Christians rejected the book of Jude because of this. I'd say if Enoch, the seventh from Adam, really prophesied those words in verse 14 and 15, is open to dispute. If he did not, and, and if Jude is just quoting from an apocryphal book and that's all, then Jude can be forgiven for that because we often quote from C.S. Lewis or from Tozer or from some other writer that we don't call an inspired, uh, you know, Canon, canonical writer, uh, but we quote them as authoritative. We quote them as having something quotable about them, something that illustrates well the point we're trying to make. One is certainly still free to just assume that these things really are true. The fact that they that their source seems to be apocryphal books, well, we just we can ignore that fact and say, well, Jude had some separate line of inspiration independent from those apocryphal books, even though he quotes them directly. <laughs> but he's still got inspiration directly, and these things really, really happened. And uh, just never mind the fact that some apocryphal writer also said the same thing. So this is, this is one of the, the, the gnarly problems with the book of Jude. Um, 
is that he quotes these things, as I've tried to demonstrate, though that I acknowledge that that is uh, problematic. I don't think that that has to militate against him as an authentic or authoritative writer because uh, preachers have the right to do this kind of thing as long as they are not deceiving their audience. If their audience knew as well as they did that these are not inspired books, you know, this Enoch, seventh from Adam, you know, uh, we all know his book. We've all read it, but uh, we all know he's not really the seventh from Adam, but that's what he calls himself for the sake of quotation. I'll call him what he calls himself, you know. That's, uh, that, that can be done as long as the author is not misrepresenting to his audience and giving them an impression that is less than accurate. Depends on how much the audience knew and he knew. Anyway, there's another problem associated with Jude, and it's obvious we're going to need, uh, we're not going to get through it all in this uh, half, but uh, <clears throat> an important, uh, I, I don't know if it's a problem, but a question that arises about Jude is, why is it that Jude resembles so much the book of Second Peter? Or at least one chapter in the book of Second Peter, chapter 2, which, where Peter warns about the coming of false teachers. It's been pointed out that though Jude only has 25 verses, 15 of them are found in 2 Peter, either in whole or in part. And the verbal similarity between Jude and 2 Peter is is very great, apparently in the Greek more than even in the English. I don't read Greek, and I can't vouch for that, except the Greek scholars have said so. They said anyone who reads it in the Greek can't help but be impressed by the the verbal similarities between Second Peter, chapter two, and, and the book of Jude, and uh, even in English, that's quite evident. You can, don't need to read Greek to see that. So that ten verses alone in the book of Jude are original, as it were. Uh, that I shouldn't say original; I should say unique to Jude. The question of originality is what's it, is what's uh, open to question, but. Um, unique to Jude, there are 10 verses. The other 15 simply parallel verses that are found in 2 Peter chapter 2. We'll, as we go through Jude verse by verse, we'll point out the places that they correspond to in 2 Peter. But the, the question is raised then, did Jude, was Jude influenced by 2 Peter? Or was 2 Peter influenced by Jude? Or a third option was, was there some other document now lost that both Peter and Jude were aware of and that they drew from? Scholars have taken all three of these positions. I mean, different scholars have held different views. Most scholars today seem to believe that Jude was written earlier. In this, I'm going to disagree with them. But I'm just telling you what most would say. If you, if you get a commentary on Second Peter or Jude written by a modern scholar, they're likely to suggest that Jude was written earlier and Second Peter was written afterwards. There's not really an excellent basis for this belief, as near as I can tell. All of the evidence that's presented in favor of Jude being earlier is ambiguous evidence, and the same points that they point to could argue the other way. No one knows for sure which book came earlier. But I'm going to suggest to you that Peter was written earlier, and that Jude was writing an expository sermon based on the text Second Peter chapter 2. Just as a preacher today might say, my text today from the scripture is so-and-so, and, he, and then he, he gives a sermon of his own about the text, basically talking about the same thing, using language from the text where, where relevant. Okay? I believe Jude is an expository sermon based upon the text, Second Peter chapter 2, which obviously I believe Second Peter was written earlier. Now, I have reasons for thinking so. Um, perhaps one of the major reasons for thinking so is that Peter, in his description of the false teachers, speaks them in the future tense. Peter says in Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1, but there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall also be false teachers among you who will bring in damnable heresies and who will corrupt and who will do this and they'll be this way and they'll do that and so forth. Peter is warning the church of, a, of the coming, future coming, of false teachers. Jude, however, speaks to them in the present tense and says they're here. They've come. Uh, he says in verse 4, For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men. <coughs> 
who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and who deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, remember, Peter said in 2 Peter 2, 1, these false teachers will even deny the Lord who bought them. 2 Peter 2, 1. Now, here he says these men have crept in and they're even denying the Lord. That's, that's only the first of several places where Jude links verbally with 2 Peter chapter 2. We'll see many more as we go through. But the point uh, I, I want to make about this is that Peter predicts the coming of such teachers. Jude indicates they are here. It'd be even as if a modern preacher today would say, Paul said, in the latter days, men will teach you know, uh, doctrines of demons, forbidding to marry and, and commanding to abstain from meats, you know, which God has ordained that we should enjoy and so forth. And even today, there is a cult in this town who teaches those very things. And, you know, I mean, it, Paul said they'd come, and now I'm telling you they're here. You know, I mean, that's, that would be a very common way to preach a sermon. And that's what Jude apparently is doing in his, in his day. Peter had said they're coming. Jude says they're here. I'm warning you. And he quotes or, or alludes heavily to Peter's text that he is drawing from. Another indication that Jude is, uh, is, is, came afterwards and is, is even alluding to Second Peter on purpose would be what he says in verse 17. In Jude 17, he says, But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, Peter being one of them, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who'd walk according to their own gun, godly lust. Well, check out Second Peter chapter 3. Verses 1 and 2, and Paul said, uh, Peter said, In the last days will come mo- mockers walking after their own ungodly lusts. Second Peter 3 makes this prediction. And Jude said, you know, the apostles predicted this. And gives almost the same words that Peter used. Now, some would argue, but, that, but he doesn't say Peter said that. He says the apostles. Why doesn't he say Peter if he's actually quoting Peter? Or alluding to Peter. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why he wouldn't, but remember that Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 3, said, and our beloved brother Paul also says these same things in all of his epistles. So that Peter uh, appeals to Paul as a confirming voice for what he's saying in 2 Peter chapter 3. And therefore, Jude could easily say, the apostles, meaning Peter, who wrote it, and Paul, who Peter calls in as a corroborating witness, um, that these are the apostles that Jude is referring to. Anyway, um, this only serves as an introduction. We have to separately go through the verses of the book, which we will. But uh, you'll find very, very close parallels between Jude and Second Peter. And although other explanations have been given and, and are, are, possi- are possibly true, the most helpful that I have found is to suggest that Second Peter was already in existence as a recognized apostolic document, therefore belonging to the church's scriptures. And Jude and his readers, knowing that, uh, Jude, Jude based his sermon on that text. Even as James, the book of James appears to be a sermon based on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it would appear to me. James, in five chapters, alludes to or quotes the Sermon on the Mount 20 times. Sounds very much like James. I mean, we can't say that... Uh, The Sermon on the Mount was influenced by James, but we can certainly say that James was influenced by the Sermon on the Mount. And as James wrote, as it were, a five chapter long sermon based on the text, Matthew 5 through 7, it appears that Jude wrote a one chapter sermon based on the text, 2 Peter chapter 2 and 3. So that is uh, that's going to be my assumption going on through. And as we go through it, we'll point out the parallels and, of course, talk about the meaning of the verses. Okay, let's uh, let's go verse by verse now through the book of Jude. Having had that earlier introduction, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. We are prone to probably pass over these openings to epistles uh, without a whole lot of thought because they resemble each other so much. Almost all the epistles have similar openings. Uh, Jude mentions who he is and in fairly common fashion describes himself as a servant 
of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul in his letters usually uh, identifies himself, first of all, as a servant, bond servant of Jesus. Um, and uh, so does Peter in his epistles. And Jude then refers to himself as the brother of James, whereas uh, Peter and Paul refer to themselves as apostles. After, after servant, they call themselves an apostle of Jesus Christ, where Jude cannot do that. Apparently, he is not an apostle, or, or if he was an apostle, he, he certainly was not one of the original apostles and therefore did not make that claim for himself. He just calls himself brother of James. As I said, this James is uh, almost certainly the James who wrote the book of James, and that means that both Jude and James were brothers of the Lord, half-brothers, we would say, to be more uh, accurate. Now, he does not address the epistle to a particular geographical area, as Paul frequently does, and as Peter does, but rather just to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. That obviously would include us, although there no doubt was some particular geographical area that Jude had in mind, because he describes a situation in the churches that may not have prevailed in churches the world over at that time and does not necessarily uh, apply to every church today either. So there was probably some particular geographical area, some particular churches at least, that he meant this to go to, but he doesn't nail it down. He doesn't keep it, uh, he doesn't restrict it to whatever churches were originally in his mind, possibly because the sermon he has here, which as I said, I think, is a, I think this is an exegetical sermon, uh, expository sermon, based upon Second Peter chapter 2, um, I believe that Jude probably realized that the conditions he's addressing can happen anywhere and do and will happen in many places. And so he just, uh, he doesn't uh, limit his audience in any way except to those who are called and sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. Now, being called, we, we don't have time to get into all the ways that the Bible speaks about people being called. But certainly being called would suggest at the very least that we have uh, heard the ultimatum of the gospel. We've heard God uh, declaring that we need to come to him. Uh, The Calvinists would go so far as to speak of what they call the effectual call, which is related to the doctrine of irresistible grace. And uh, while the Bible sometimes talks about people who were called by God and didn't come, Calvinist theology speaks of two kinds of calls, calls the, the call that doesn't necessarily bring about uh, irresistibly the repentance of the person called, uh, which is just, I guess, God's voice going out and nothing more than that. And then they think there's the thing called the effectual call, which when God has elected someone to be saved, he calls them irresistibly. And uh, this passage would possibly be used by the Calvinists to suggest that Christians are particularly those who are effectually called, because in a sense, all people are called. Uh, Jesus said many are called, but few are chosen. And uh, Paul said in his uh, sermon on Mars Hill that God now commands all men everywhere to repent. So the call to repentance is universal, but obviously Jude is restricting this epistle Uh, to the audience of those who were called and heard the call. And that doesn't necessarily mean that he has a a Calvinistic concept of an effectual calling, that the Christians are called in a special sense that others are not called. That is to say, the Christians have been effectually called and irresistibly drawn, whereas others have just, you know, been kind of generally called without any power given to them to respond, which is what the Calvinists would suggest. But all Christians... As, as well as many people who are not Christians, perhaps all people who are not Christians, are called. At least everyone who hears the gospel, to them the gospel is a call to follow Jesus. And not all respond to it. But the ones he's addressing are those who have not only been called, but are also sanctified by God the Father. And, and the term sanctified also, like the word called, has more than one use in Scripture. In, in the book of Hebrews, for example, the word sanctified seems to be used almost the way the word justified is used in in the epistles of Paul generally. Uh, The the writer of Hebrews seems to use the word sanctified freely as as, as someone who's been forgiven of their sins and rendered holy in that sense, whereas it would appear in some other writers, uh, Paul and maybe Peter, we could say, the word sanctified is in contrast or in addition to 
justification, that justification is the act of being forgiven and being declared righteous, and then sanctification has to do with the way you live. It has to do with God's working in your life to make you a holy person, sanctified, of course, coming from the same root as the word holy. And uh, But holy simply means set apart. And where it says here we've been set apart by God the Father, uh, that doesn't have to mean anything more than that in the sight of God, because we have responded to the call of God, he has set us in a different category than others. Christians are separate, not geographically separate, but separate in the, in the dealings of God from others. And that, you know, by the way, Peter says we've been sanctified by the Holy Spirit in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. Jude says we're sanctified by God the Father. This shouldn't be thought to be a contradiction, of course. Um, it's just a matter, even the word sanctified means different things in different places. Here, I think it may simply mean that God has called us and uh, we have heard the call and because we've responded, God has categorized us differently than everybody else. We're set apart in the mind and in the dealings of God. And that is what the word sanctified can mean and probably does mean here. God the Father has uh, now re labeled us, recategorized us, uh, set us apart for himself. And we are preserved in Jesus Christ. And that, too, is a very good uh, Calvinistic text for those who would uh, seek to teach the perseverance of the saints. That Christians, the ones to whom he's writing, are preserved in Jesus Christ. And uh, it is argued, of course, that Christians are preserved in such a sense that they could never fall away. However, there's certainly that doctrine cannot necessarily be extracted from this usage here. All he's really saying is that those who he's writing to have been preserved in Christ. They have not defected. It goes on in this epistle to point out that some have defected and there are false teachers and there's great danger of defection. But he's writing to those who are who have not been defect, who have not defected. And he's giving God the credit for the fact that they have been preserved in Christ. Uh, this is not the same thing as a promise that there is uh, that they will indefinitely and always in, and unconditionally be preserved and that there's no way they could possibly change that status. But he's writing to people who, at least up to the point he's written, they are still there. They're still in the Lord and uh, hopefully they will remain until their death. Uh, perseverance of the saints is certainly what God expects of us. And will enable us to to uh, experience if we simply remain in the faith, and that doesn't require works on our part. That simply remains that, that simply involves remaining childlike and not uh, not apostatizing. And so his readers are those who have been preserved in Christ Jesus. I think what he's suggesting there is that in in view of the fact that there is danger of defection, and that's the very reason he's writing to them, uh, they need to. Uh, focus on the need to remain as they are now uh, in Jesus and to be preserved there as they have been up to this point. Mercy, peace and love be multiplied to you. Uh, obviously, we could talk about those words a little more, but we've encountered them so much in the New Testament. We have so little time. We ought to probably move along to the more distinctive elements of the epistle. So verse three, he says, beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, it sounds like Jude had it on his heart to write a, a general epistle, probably of encouragement and mutual consolation, mutual uh, edification. Uh, just he wanted to write to them concerning the common salvation. But. By the time he got around to writing, apparently he was aware of a special need to address a particular problem, the need for them to contend for the faith. It sounds as if he originally had different intentions, but found it necessary to write, as he ended up writing, a warning that uh, the faith was under attack by false teachers and that they needed to be prepared to contend for it. Now, that doesn't mean that Christians are to be contentious. Contending does suggest uh, standing uh, for and arguing for as necessary, defending the faith. Uh, Paul contended and disputed in the streets of Athens uh, when he came there. And, of course, we know that Paul disputed frequently with the Jews, and so did Stephen before him. And 
you know, a lot of Christians want to avoid disputes. They want to avoid unpleasantness. And they say, well, why don't we just get along? Why don't we just, uh, you know, forget about all doctrinal differences? If people are, you know, sincere, if people really want to serve God, even if their idea of a God is a different God than the God of the Bible, uh, you know, is that really all so bad? Is that really all, is it worth uh, causing an ugly scene about? I mean, if you argue, then hostilities may arise and it may, who knows, there, there's even been church splits and so forth, which are ugly and hard to endure. And maybe it would be better if we just kind of mellowed out and, and uh, just allowed people to believe whatever they wanted to believe. Um, but of course, that's not, that's not open to us. Uh, we are taught and commanded by Jesus to teach all nations, to observe all things he commanded to preach the gospel to them. And uh, this, of course, suggests that we have to confront the false gospels that they are believing and teach them to do something different than what they've been taught up to this point to do. Obviously, if we're going to teach them to do what Jesus said, they must not already know it. They're doing something else that they've been instructed by the world to do. And so we have to confront the, the evangelistic effort. The mission of the church is a confrontational effort. Now, what Jude is talking about here is not so much going out and confronting the world, but confronting those in the church, because the world has come in. And that's what he says. The world has uh, not been content just to live and let live. They have been intruding into the church and corrupting the church. It says, for certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness, which means license or permissiveness, and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this may be the first point at which Jude intentionally connects with Second Peter chapter 2. Because in Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1, uh, Peter described false teachers as doing this very thing. He said, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly... Bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them. Now, Peter said the false teachers will secretly bring in destructive heresies and even denying the Lord. Well, Jude says these people have come in secretly. They've come in. They've crept in unnoticed and they deny the Lord, the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So he is essentially saying that those false teachers that Peter said would come, they have arrived. (laughs) Peter was right. Here they are. They're denying the Lord. Now, the fact that these people have crept into the church unnoticed and also are denying God and denying the Lord presents an interesting conundrum here. How is it that people who actually deny Jesus could be unnoticed in the church where obviously the church, at least before these people arrived, did not deny Jesus, affirm Jesus, worship Jesus? How could someone who denies Jesus come into the church and not be noticed as a as someone with a different doctrine? Well, obviously, these people were not verbally saying, I deny Jesus or I renounce Jesus. They would they'd certainly be noticed in that case. Their denial of God certainly must have been in in a more subtle way. And we know that in Titus chapter one, Paul said that uh, they profess to know God, but in their works, they deny him. And it is possible to deny the Lord in other ways than verbally in your works. You can deny him and people who profess to know him often in in fact, deny him by their behavior or they misrepresent his teaching. Now, in this case, the false teachers were, uh, as we shall see reading on further in their lives, they were, in fact, denying the Lord. But they were also misrepresenting the teaching of Jesus. They did not deny the grace of God, but they just twisted it. The concept of grace was twisted to be understood as licentiousness. It says in verse four, they have turned and they turn the grace of our God into licentiousness. Now, licentiousness meaning permissiveness. You can easily see that such teachers exist in the church today. Those who turn the grace of God into a doctrine of permissiveness. And I, I don't think many of us are so naive as not to have encountered this already or been aware of it. There are people out there who say, well, I'm saved by grace. That means I can get away with everything. Under the law, you couldn't get away with stuff, but you can get away with it under grace because we're not under law, we're under grace. And that means that God loves me no matter what I do. All I have to do is believe. And maybe I only, some, some of you actually believe you only have to believe once. 
one time, and then you don't have to believe anymore. And uh, if you did believe once, then you're in and you got your ticket. But that seems to turn the concept of grace into a concept of uh, permission to do whatever you want. And that is certainly not what Paul taught about grace or Peter or Jesus, for that matter. Paul taught in Titus chapter uh, 3 and verse 11, I guess it is. Let me see what verse it is. I think it's verse 11. At least close to there. It might be 10. That the grace of God, he said, uh, I'm sorry, it's chapter 2. That's where I'm getting off here. Chapter 2, verse 11. Titus 2, 11. Paul says, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us, that is the grace of God when it appeared, teaches us this, that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. That's what grace teaches us. The real teaching of grace in Scripture is that when grace comes to you, when grace is revealed to you, it itself teaches you to live a godly life, teaches you to deny worldliness and ungodly lusts. The grace of God teaches you to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Uh, Any doctrine of grace that turns grace into permission to sin and get away with it impunity with with impunity is uh, is a false doctrine of grace it's not the grace of god as taught by the apostles or by christ when it says of jesus in john chapter 1 and verse 12 that we beheld his glory i see verse 14 the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth jesus was full of grace that certainly doesn't mean he went around sinning because of grace, you know, he's permitted to do whatever he wanted. Jesus lived a very, uh, a very holy life. He never sinned. And he stuck very close to the will of his father and didn't feel himself at liberty to do otherwise. And yet he was full of grace. The grace of God is not permission to be carnal or to be sinful or to be selfish. The grace of God <coughs> forgives us of those previous times that we were that way on the agreement that we have renounced that. You cannot receive the grace of God without repentance. And the assumption in receiving grace is that you have renounced the former way of life. And if you have not so renounced it, then you haven't yet received grace because you haven't repented yet. And so the grace of God can never be correctly construed as permission to sin. It is, of course, the case that those who are under grace, when they do sin, have the expectation that God will forgive them. But they never consider that grace gives them permission to sin or makes sin a little thing or a light thing. Those who are, in fact, under grace have been taught that they must live godly. If they are ungodly at any point, then grace is there too to reestablish their relationship with God upon repentance. But uh, but it's not there to say it's okay to sin. And that's what... That's the subtle thing that has crept into the church in many quarters. It crept in, in, apparently, in Jude's day already. In the second century, there was a lot of that. They called it antinomianism. And uh, there's a lot of antinomianism today. Sometimes it's, it's even mistaken for Calvinism. And Calvinism doesn't agree with this. Calvinism uh, does not teach you can do whatever you want to because you're under grace. Calvinism teaches that if you've received grace, you can, it'll show by your holy living. But... Um, Anyway, this, it's really antinomianism that teaches these things, and you'll find it in many uh, respectable denominations. You'll find individual churches and pastors and, and preachers who hold something like this. Now, Jude considers this to be a damnable heresy that essentially denies the Lord, Jesus Christ. And it does, because it denies lordship, the lordship of Jesus. There are Christian writers today who are not ashamed to deny the necessity of the lordship of Jesus Christ in the the lives of believers. I don't mind naming them because they've written books. They say it freely. A guy named Zane Hodges, another guy named Charles Ryrie, have written books defending the Christian's right to live in sin because he's under grace. And they they are involved right now, currently, in a literary debate between other people like John MacArthur, John MacArthur, uh, part of his contribution to this debate was the book, The Gospel According to Jesus. And John MacArthur, in his book, is arguing that we need to have Jesus as Lord or else we don't have him as Savior. Of course, this is entirely biblical. That's what the church has taught throughout history, that you, you, when you receive Jesus, you receive 
Jesus the Lord as well as Jesus the Savior at the same time. If you haven't received Jesus the Lord, then you haven't received Jesus the Savior. Because if you haven't received the Lord, you haven't received Jesus. Because <laughs> he's the Lord. You can't divorce his lordship from his person. And, uh, and yet, uh, critical of John MacArthur and critical of others like him who are teaching Orthodox Christianity, you've got some of these guys, uh, like the ones I mentioned, who are saying, no, that's heresy. That makes, uh, Christ- that makes salvation a matter of works and so forth. Now, they, they're totally misunderstanding that, but that's a shame because they're outright saying that a Christian can be a person even who has denied the Lord. If you deny the Lord, if you, if you live as a Satanist after your conversion, you're still saved. Because it's grace you're under, not works, not law. And that is a denial of the lordship of Jesus. Yeah, those are two of the guys who've, who've written critically uh, against what they call lordship salvation. Lordship salvation is just biblical Christianity. You, 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 when you receive Jesus, you obtain in the bargain a lord, you know. And, um, but but they, they give that a label as if it's a heresy. They call it lordship salvation. And uh, they write to refute it. Uh, there are several books by these men. My guess is that they probably live r- relatively holy lives. I mean, um, you see, they would also say that holiness is better than sin. I mean, they're not saying that sin is really good or sin is OK, really. What they're saying is uh, you can't really demand that a person, when they get saved, must live a holy life or must even endeavor to live a holy life. Because they're saved by grace, if you add anything to that, any demands or any requirements on them, then you're suddenly corrupting the gospel, they believe, and and you're adding to it. But they would still say that there are, you know, sin is not a good way to live and uh, that people ought to live uh, in obedience to God, you know, for their own good, maybe, or just because it'll less complicate your life, you know. I mean, they're not making a commitment to obey God a requirement. For salvation, but they're still saying obeying God is better than not obeying God, and so they're. I mean, they're, it's not like they're trying to throw out uh, God's commandments or His instructions altogether. They're just saying that salvation has nothing to do with having any kind of a commitment to obey. It's just believing Jesus. So uh, this is a, a, a present controversy, and there are books being published on both sides of this debate. Um, But it seems to me that those who are denying or attacking what they call lordship salvation are really just denying the lordship (laughs) of Jesus. Um, And therefore, this is a very now this says they're on the false teachers are ungodly men. I'm not prepared to say that those men that I mentioned are living ungodly lives, but they certainly appear to my mind to be turning the grace of God into license. And uh, in, in a certain sense, denying the Lord. Now, I dare say that they're not going as far as the people that Jude's describing. But the direction they've gone is the direction that Jude is describing. They may not have gotten all the way. They're certainly not all the way to where these people are that Jude is describing because we go on to read the terrible, wicked lives that these people are living. And I I seriously doubt that that description would fit the men I mentioned. Same one, yeah. Same Ryrie, uh-huh. Ryrie Study Bible and leading dispensational. Uh, by the way, John MacArthur is also a dispensationalist, but he criticizes Ryrie and Zane Hodges, who were both uh, Dallas Theological Seminary professors at one time. And he, he accuses uh, them of being too dispensational. I mean, he's, he's a dispensationalist himself and holds to dispensational theology unashamedly, but he feels like uh, there is a weakness in some branches of dispensationalism in that they... Um, they make they make the Sermon on the Mount and so forth not relevant to Christians and and uh, that's of a different dispensation you know anyway uh, it's not my point to get into dispensationalism here but uh, but that is the same rivalry yes same man um, now verse five <clears throat> but I want to remind you though you once knew this that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, there are three examples here from the past. 
And, uh, you know, Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, also gave uh, some examples like these. In fact, he gave uh, two of the same ones. In 2 Peter, he refers to the angels who fell. He also refers, uh, Peter refers also to the, the generation that perished in the flood. And Noah is being preserved. And he referred to Sodom. Now, Jude also gives three illustrations, two of which overlap or correspond to two that Peter gave. Both Peter and Jude mentioned the angels that fell and they mentioned Sodom. But whereas Peter talked about the flood victims, uh, Jude leaves that particular illustration out and instead mentions the, uh, def- the Jews who came out of Egypt and who apostatized and died in the wilderness. Peter doesn't mention them. So there's, there's a point of correspondence and yet a, an independence here, too, of the two books. The fact that they both mentioned the angels that fell is a particular indication that, they were, uh, th- that they're not entirely independent because the idea of the angels falling... Uh, and the words that are said here is something that's not found in the Old Testament. They got this from some independent source, uh, possibly from some apocryphal book that we don't know about, or maybe it's an interpretation. Some people think that the angels that fell or who left their first estate is an interpretation of Genesis 6 uh, and the opening verses there where the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful to look upon and took wives of them as many as they chose. And there's been much questioning as to who the sons of God were in that situation. And one view is that they were angels and that they came down and they uh, got involved in in sexual uh, unions with uh, human women. And if the apostles held that view, then that must be the right view. And some people think that Peter and Jude are referring to that. Now, they don't necessarily refer to that. They might be referring to something entirely different. But... Uh, one way that some people have favored this notion is that after it mentions the angels in verse 6, it seems to liken them to Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 7. It says, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh. Now, the argument goes like this. Jude likens the sin of the angels to the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. What was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, uh, they were involved in sexual immorality. They went after strange flesh. Now, strange flesh doesn't mean peculiar flesh. It means foreign or, or, um, uh, you know, that which is not native, that which is not normal, that which is, uh, they went after perverted sex. And, uh, of course, in Sodom and Gomorrah, it was homosexual sex that that was the perverted form they went after but it's argued that for angels to go after humans that's perverted too obviously human women are designed to be joined to human men not to angels and therefore it is as strange flesh to the angels to go after human women as for human men to go after human men as in Sodom and Gomorrah so some feel that there's a link here that confirms that the angels falling is a reference back to Genesis 6, where the sons of God went after the daughters of men. Now, in response to this, those uh, like myself who do not necessarily believe the sons of God were angels in Genesis 6. But we do believe angels fell, but we don't believe that this is referring back to Genesis 6. would point out that the, the similarity between the angels who sinned and Sodom and Gomorrah that Jude is making is not a similarity of the sin, but a similarity of the fate. You see, what he says about the angels who sinned in verse 6 is they are reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. In other words, they didn't get away with it. They sinned and now, they've, now they await judgment. They, 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 they're punished. And then it, as Sodom and Gomorrah, now, there is obviously a link of similarity to Sodom and Gomorrah, but is it a similarity in the nature of the sin, or is it a similarity in that both cases are cases of people who didn't get away with it? They both come under judgment. You see, when he says, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, what it seems to me is what he's saying is that the angels that sinned are in, are, were caught. 
and they were they're reserved in chains under darkness, waiting the judgment. Similarly, Sodom and Gomorrah and, their, and the sinners there, they were caught too. And both of these serve as examples to us of those uh, who will be judged because of corruption, because of uh, wickedness. Now, there's also that example in verse 5 of those who came out of Egypt. He says, uh, the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Since this is linked up with the other two illustrations in verse 6 and 7 of angels and Sodom and Gomorrah, it would appear that all three of these are intended by Jude to be examples to us of God judging the wicked people. These people once apparently were saved. They came out of Egypt. That's a picture of salvation. But they didn't stay that way because of defection. Now, by the way, Jude is not the first to make that particular illustration an example for Christians. If you'll look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you'll find that Paul has done exactly the same thing. In 1 Corinthians 10, beginning with verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. That's all the ones who came out of Egypt. They were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. They drank the same spiritual drink. But verse 5 says, But with most of them God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. And verse 6, Now these things became our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now, it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 that because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 8. And uh, I think it's around verse 11 or 12. But uh, the point I want to make is that it is true that if we... Yeah, it's verse 11, Ecclesiastes eight eleven. It is true that the judgment against sinners is not always speedy. And it is true that because judgment is not speedy, many times sinners feel like they got away with it and will continue to get away with it. After all, they did something. There was a moment where they wondered if they're going to get caught. That moment passed. They weren't caught. And they thought, oh, that wasn't so scary. I can get away with that anytime. And they drew it again. And hey, look at that. They got away with it again. And the sentence against their evil work is not speedily executed. Therefore, they're, they become more established in their evil patterns. But what the scripture teaches is that there's no grounds for this encouragement of the sinner that he's going to get away with it. Even if his particular sin has not been instantly judged, there are examples that God has given in the past of people who maybe they seem to get away with it initially, too. But they but they didn't ultimately. Ultimately, they were judged. Those who came out of Egypt, many of them perished. The angels who rebelled. Maybe they got away with it for a while. Who knows? Whatever the situation was, but they didn't last. They, they're now incarcerated, waiting for the judgment. And Sodom and Gomorrah, yeah, they got away with their sin for quite a while until their cup was full, the iniquity was filled, and then they didn't get away with it anymore. And all these cases serve as examples for us so that we don't have to wonder whether God ultimately judges sin or not, just because we see sinners around us who don't seem to suffer for it. They sin, and they sin again, and they sin some more. And they go on sinning, and they seem to die in peace. You say, my goodness, is there no justice? Is there no reckoning? Well, we don't have to wonder about that. God has already given us precedents, a great number of precedents, of God flooding the world, as Peter points out, and Jude does not, of God judging even his own people when they came out. Uh, he had saved them, but they defected, so he killed them. In the wilderness, even angels. I mean, if anyone, you know, should be able to get away with stuff, you'd think it was superhuman beings like angels, but not so. Now, we don't know very much about the occasion of the angels sinning. There is, of course, one tradition that uh, Lucifer was a, a, a chief angel, one of three chief angels. And having a third of the angels under his command or under his oversight, and that Lucifer rebelled against God and was kicked out of heaven, became the, the devil, and took his third of the angels with him. That is, he staged a rebellion and his angels followed him, and those angels became the demons and were kicked out. Everyone knows that scenario. That's a pretty standard one. Uh, it's not easy to defend it uh, from strict exegesis of Scripture, but uh, there are some who believe that this is a, a reference to that. Now, certainly this Scripture does say there are angels that sinned. It does not provide any of the other elements of that scenario. Uh, nor do we know whether the apostles believed that particular scenario, but they, we cannot deny that there are angels 
who were once holy angels, but defected one way or another, whether it be in Lucifer's rebellion, as some people postulate, or whether it was Genesis 6, where sons of God came down, or whether it was yet some other time, uh, the scriptures simply do not give us uh, that much information on this, uh, this defection and apostasy of angels. Now, verse 8, likewise, apparently similar to these cases just mentioned, also these dreamers defile the flesh, like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah did, apparently, reject authority. This does not state what authority in particular. Was it the church authorities, like the apostles they were rejecting? Was it the authority of Jesus, the lordship of Jesus? Earlier it said they denied the Lord. So they might reject, maybe they just reject the concept of authority at all. Everybody can do whatever they want and no one has any right to tell anyone else what to do. There are people who have that opinion of authority. Maybe that's it. In any case, we know that the, their rejection of authority must be a rejection of legitimate authority or else Jude would not bring it up as a, as a sin. There is such a thing as legitimate authority, beginning with the authority of Jesus. And there are delegated authorities, too, that God has delegated authority to certain persons, rulers, church leaders, parents, things like that. You know, I mean, to reject authority in principle is is the attitude of many people. And uh, basically, the rejection of authority is simply a, a demand that I do my own thing without anyone interfering, without anyone telling me I can't do it. It's just self-serving. And he later tells about that, that they just serve themselves. Um they speak evil of dignitaries, the end of verse 8. Now, the word dignitaries, uh, it's hard to know what he's referring to as dignitaries. Uh, again, it may be people like the apostles. Literally, in the, in the Greek, it's uh, glories. They speak evil of glories. And Paul does refer in some of his epistles to his companions as they are the glory of Christ. Uh, it's possible that Jude is thinking of persons who are... Uh, authorities in the church and it would therefore be sort of a, a corollary of rejecting authority that they speak evil of those who have authority yet he says michael the archangel in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of moses dared not to bring against him a reviling accusation but said the lord rebuke you now this story is not found in the old testament but it is found or was found apparently in a now lost document which some of the church fathers were aware of and told us about it. It's, it was called the Assumption of Moses. It was not an inspired document, and therefore it raises serious questions as to whether this event is a true event. After all, if, it's, if it was recorded in an uninspired document, one would have to know, well, how, did they, how did the person who wrote it know about this uh, secret, invisible thing happening between Michael and Satan? Now, there's a couple ways we can go with this. One is that we could say, well, Jude's reference to it renders it trustworthy, makes it a, his, a historical account. Or else, I mean, it's, I mean, Jude's book is in our Bible, and the Bible is true, and therefore this actually happened. That's possible. Unless we, re, unless we postulate that Jude himself knew that it was strictly an apocryphal story, but he knew his readers were familiar with it. And just as we might make a, an illustration about Humpty Dumpty falling down and, and not being able to be put back together again, and so your life can be so shattered that that uh, no one could ever put it back together again, short of God. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't, you know, reassemble your life and get it back together again. It doesn't mean if we make such a statement that we believe in the story of Humpty Dumpty. It just means that we assume everyone knows that story and that that story, uh, we have no objection to bringing up the language of that story or the event of that story to illustrate a point. Uh, Jude may have been referring to this event uh, not saying that it really happened, but rather, you know, you know the story, how Michael and Satan did that. We find Michael in such a case not even daring to rebuke Satan himself or bring a reviling, reviling accusation of Satan, but invoking God's rebuke upon him. And we do see in Zechariah chapter 3, uh, the Lord says to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Whether Christians ought to rebuke the devil or not is an interesting question because Christians do it all the time. I mean, some Christians do. The Bible nowhere tells us to rebuke the devil. I once heard a preacher say, and he was just, it, his mind just slipped from what the scripture actually said, but he said, the scripture says rebuke the devil and he'll flee from you. No, the scripture doesn't say rebuke the devil and he'll flee from you. Just try it. You'll find. Sometimes he doesn't. The Bible says resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And resistance can, in, in a military sense can be a protracted campaign. 
uh, re resistance of an enemy is not something that you just do in a moment and then the enemy's gone. You know, necessarily you resist in a in a in a wrestling match, in a in a in a war. And if you keep up the resistance, eventually the guarantee is you'll win. The devil will flee, not you. And the devil, the only time the devil ever gets the advantage of you is when you stop resisting. If you continue to resist, he can't win. But uh, rebuking the devil. Yes, sir. Zechariah 3, 2. Um, that's where uh, the Lord said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Or the angel of the Lord said that or someone. But um, that's not Michael. And that's not a reference to this situation. Now, on the other hand, uh, if, well, you know, if, if Jude had said when Satan and Michael were disputing over the body of Joshua, the high priest, he said, the Lord rebuke you. That might connect with Zechariah 3, too, but he's obviously referring to something else that's from extra biblical sources. Anyway, I, I dare say that rebuking the devil is a questionable practice. I'm not saying that the Bible says it can't be done, but uh, it does. It is questionable because the Bible nowhere advocates it. It says, but these people speak evil of what they do not know, probably meaning what they don't understand, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. Now, Paul said the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God because they're foolishness to him. And they, they're, they're foolish to him because they have to be discerned spiritually, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2. These people make fun of things and mock things that they don't understand. Why? Because they're not spiritual men. They can't understand spiritual truth. They only know what they can, what a natural man can know. What they know, like their 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 animal side of them knows their lusts, their natural uh, cognitive powers. They 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 can't accept spiritual truth. They mock things they don't understand. Usually, spiritual things would be in that category. Only the things they know naturally, uh, at a level not much higher than animals, do they. Uh, understand and acknowledge certain things and they corrupt themselves in what they can reason naturally, but not uh, they don't accept. You see, they corrupt themselves because they don't accept the spiritual truth that grace changes you spiritually and makes spiritual demands on you. They, they turn grace into permissiveness. That's they don't understand it. If you well, if I don't if I if grace means I don't get in trouble for my sins, then that must mean grace gives me permission to sin. That's their re natural reasoning. They don't understand spiritually uh, that grace really works in you a hatred for sin and a, and a desire for holiness. So they corrupt themselves in their uh, limitations of their knowledge to that which they can know naturally. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, having run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Now, there's three sins here. The way of Cain. It's hard to know what the way of Cain is. We know that Cain killed Abel, but I don't know that he's saying that these people were killing anyone necessarily. 